What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the channel. I am Miss Titus, and tonight we're going to find out how a Hebrew Israelite became a Christian. Welcome back to the channel, you guys. If you are here, please give me a thumbs up right now, immediately, immediately. I would appreciate it. I am so excited about what's going on tonight. I know I'm not looking at y'all. I was looking at the comments. Um, but thank you, Mr. Phil Fox. I see you in the building. Nate. The gift of God has arrived. What's up, Nate and the Revelator and Prime Minister? Thank you, guys. Hello, Brother Jeff Short. Hello, hello. So, y'all, tonight we're going to talk about Hebrew Israelism. I have one of my dear friends and my brother in Christ here with me. His name is Jordan Ortiz. I'm sure a lot of y'all have seen his testimony on different channels. And every time I hear it, it touches my heart. So I said, I got to get him on my channel so y'all can hear it. So, um, y'all make sure to get moderators, please. Please, for the love of God, please keep the Hebrew Israelites on at bay because I know sometimes they can get a little emotional. That's fine. Y'all can hang out. Just, just don't try it because it's, this is not the place for that. But without further ado, did I say that right? Further ado? Whatever. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Um, brother, brother Jordan is in the building. Everyone yep. say, hello, Jordan. What's going on, everybody? Yeah. Uh, without further badu, we'll just say like that. <laughs> 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 What's up, everybody? Y'all, so Jordan, can you tell us about your channel before we get started? Uh, sure. Um, if you uh, type in on YouTube at Servant of Christ Ministries, my channel should pop up. Uh, the purpose of the channel is to help people uh, understand the Bible. I try to make it as easy as possible to understand and grasp. I know there are a lot of new believers out there. They're picking up their scriptures and they're like, I have no idea what's going on in this chapter. And so my job is to kind of walk through it. Uh, they call it expository preaching. That's the famous word for verse by verse teaching. Um, and of course, yes, I was an ex. I was a Hebrew Israelite at one point. I became a Christian and my love for people and wanting them to understand the Bible. That's how Servant of Christ Ministries was born. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't know what happened to my light. So <laughs> y'all, I'm having all types of problems tonight, but we're going to fix that here in just a second. Um, you know, I just want to go ahead and get started. And when you start talking, then I'll try to see if I can fix my light problem. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, Jordan, can you tell us just just to get things started? Mm -hmm. What is a black Hebrew Israelite? Can we start there? Sure. Um, so a black Hebrew Israelite is an individual who subscribes to the belief that they are the true Israelites. They believe that their nationality is true. Um, they believe that they are Hebrew Israelites. They believe that you have to keep the law to be saved or depending on the group, uh, you have to keep the law to maintain salvation. And when I talk about the law, I'm talking about the 613 commands uh, given uh, to uh, the children of Israel. Uh, they believe that they still have to keep those today. Now, that's kind of a and they only believe that uh, people who are black, Hispanic and Native American are going to be saved. If you do not fall within those three categories, you are not even eligible for salvation under Christ. And that's a very broad uh, teaching on, you know, what they believe and who they are. Uh, false teachers, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So how did you get exposed to it? Like, is that something you were born into or was it a family thing or what? Um, it was definitely a family thing. I like how you're acting like you've never heard, but <laughs> you're very good at this interview. Good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, uh, I was introduced to it uh, through my mom and stepdad. Uh, my mother had uh, a very bad experience, uh, a supernatural experience where she was kind of possessed. And um, she cried out to God at the end of that saying, Lord, please show me who you are. A um, few months pass. She's introduced to my stepfather, who is a black Hebrew Israelite. He introduces the doctrine to my mother. My mother takes that as a sign that God answered her prayer. Now, uh, keep this in mind, you know, when before me and my mom even started thinking about Hebrew Israelism, uh, we didn't study the Bible. We believed in God existing. Um, we came from a Catholic background uh, primarily, and but we never studied the Bible. I mean, at all. We never opened its pages. We never read anything about scripture. And so when this group or when my stepdad comes with the Hebrew Israelite theology, my mother buys it hook, line and sinker because we didn't have a foundation to begin with. I really believe and I've told people before, I really believe that uh, if, it, if it was a Jehovah's Witness, if it was a Mormon, it was anybody who came during that uh, that traumatic time in my mother's life. We could have easily been um, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, or Mormons or whatever, seven day Adventists. Um, and so that's how I got into it. And I was um, that was in New York before I actually moved uh, to Georgia. 
that was going to be my next question because I'm from the South and I mm -hmm. had never really seen anything of like a Hebrew Israelite thing going on up until maybe like four or five years ago. So like in New York, how mm -hmm. big was it? First of all, how long ago was it that you really like were in this? Um, I would say I was introduced to it around the age of 14, uh, mm -hmm. my stepdad. Uh, and even when I was introduced to it, we weren't like full throttle hanging on to the beliefs. We were just kind of learning, uh, mm -hmm. but we didn't kind of follow, you know, wearing the fringes and all that, not in the early stages. Um, it wasn't until, um, I moved to Georgia around my high school years where I actually, we actually got serious and we got with a, mm -hmm. uh, a group down here. Uh, they they were called at the time BOCC, the branches of Christ church. Then they tra traded it to the body of Christ church. And that's kind of how we um, kind of got into it, I guess, and how it started. Do you know if it was like affiliated with One West or is this like an offshoot type group or like a moderate type of group? Yeah, um, the group that I was a part of in Atlanta was more moderate, but everything I, der I believe derived from One West. That's, I went to One West maybe once or twice um, and just kind of visiting. It wasn't like I was part of the group or anything like that. I didn't know anybody. Um, but then after that, this is more of an offshoot group. And what you'll find is a lot of the groups, um, if they have a disagreement on something, they'll split and just start a whole new, a whole new uh, school of thought. Um, and so you, this is why you end up with things like ISUPK. And, and to be honest, even some Christians will break up and start whole new movements and things like that. So it's really no different. Um, a lot of religious sects, when they have disagreements among the elders, they decide to start their own little group. And then their rules may be a little bit different from the other rules, or they may not be as extreme as some groups. Um, so my group was more uh, on the moderate side to begin with. Yeah. OK. OK. So what was like your role? Because I know there's some people who have like a lot of authority and then they've kind of got like little minions or something like that. Were you teaching people or were you kind of just like on the student level? Uh, I was pretty much on the student level. I um, at the very most I did at a camp at one time was read. Uh, so, you know, when they say ready, read right. and, and that. I was the guy who started reading the scripture. Um, I didn't yell because that was not really my tone, but I just read. I try to read as loud as I can. I don't think I had a mic at the time. But no, I didn't have any uh, authority. I wasn't an elder or deacon or anything like that. Oh, so you weren't cussing poor old ladies and, and white folks out on the no, corners? Uh, nope. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank goodness I wasn't at that point. Yeah. What were your views on Christianity when you were a Hebrew Israelite? Oh, good question. Um, my views on Christianity was it was false uh, and they were teaching lies and they didn't understand the truth. They weren't keeping the commandments. They were teaching um, uh, idolatry. The cross was an idol to be worshipped. Uh, I believed Christians um, didn't understand the scriptures. I, And to be honest, and this is where it gets a little scary, many Christians don't. You know what I mean? A lot of Christians are not familiar with the word of God. They don't know why they believe what they believe. So when you get groups like um, IUIC or any Hebrew Israelite group who are quoting verses, who have studied their doctrine, it's not that they understand the scriptures better. They just understand why they believe what they believe, whether it's false or true in some instances. Um, and so a lot of the time I would look at Christians that way. It's like, oh, you just don't even know your Bible. Let me quote a scripture or a verse. And a lot of them would be stumped. Um, and it's not like I stumped them with the truth. I just stumped them because they didn't know and they didn't have a foundation in Christ to begin with. So, yeah, I just viewed Christians as, you know, unbelievers who were not going to be saved unless they became uh, part of a commandment keeping law keeping uh, Hebrew Israelite group. Christopher, oh, sorry, that's not Christopher Dupas. Christopher Dupas brings up a good question. Mm -hmm. What was your what was your view of Christ's deity? Well, you'll be interested to know that I did not have a view on the deity mm -hmm. of Christ because it wasn't taught um, yeah. at all. Um, it was, remember, everything is is based on identity as far as who are who you are, right? You are a Hebrew Israelite. You belong to these people. But it was never taught that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. That was never taught, at least in the camp I was a part of. I'll just uh, limit it to that just so I can be fair. So how do they feel about salvation in general like is there a plan of salvation is there a heaven is there a hell what what is even the point of being a hebrew israelite what's the the good news uh the good news is uh okay so heaven and hell is a concept that they believe but of course is going to be skewered in some ways um and when it comes to their overall ideals on that 
um, it's not really consistent. Um, a lot of the time, and the doctrine changes a lot, uh, especially when they get new light or new understanding. Um, and unfortunately, some people who were part of Hebrew Israelite groups were kicked out of camps or kicked out of the quote unquote kingdom of heaven. They were no longer a part of God's people. And then later on, they would have to retract that statement after they've already broken up the family. And then they would say, oh, well, you can come back. We have a new understanding on that. So it's not really, you're not going to find any consistency uh, when it comes to theology just because it breaks up. And, you know, there are just so many different groups with it. Did you ever have people challenge you on your beliefs and like cause you to think, huh, hmm, maybe they're right or, you know what I'm saying? Um, I don't, I don't think I had anybody really challenge me, um, to be completely honest. When I was part of the Hebrew Israelite group, um, nobody really confronted me. And to be completely honest, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that, uh, I want to say strong as far as the beliefs go. It was more like, okay, we, we talked about the Bible only within our group, mm -hmm. but I really wouldn't talk that much with people outside of the group um, until they became a part of the group. But nobody ever challenged me when it came uh, to the Bible. I've had conversations and nobody ever really thought me like, you know, had me think like, huh. But um, there was a point where it was the scriptures uh, that started uh, these red flags uh, going off. Um, and it was actually um, Jesus's birth. Uh, because as a Hebrew Israelite, I believe that Joseph and Mary had relations, right? Let's keep it PG for the YouTube algorithm. Right? <laughs> um, Appreciate so it. yeah, you, you got it, sis. Um, so, <laughs> you know, Joseph and Mary had relations and that's how Jesus was born. That's what Hebrew Israelites believe. They do not believe that Jesus was supernaturally born. Unfortunately, when I read the scripture, I saw that it was a supernatural birth and I was, I had questions. I was like, well, this seems like she's not lying to the angel, right? Like, how is all this going to happen? And the angel's talking to her. And and when I read Matthew, I was like, this seems like it's supernatural. And I remember taking it to the elders because a lot of the time when you're a student, when you're not an elder or a deacon or anything like that, you don't feel really adequate. No matter how much you study, you still have to default to the elders to make sure you're teaching correctly. So I remember taking them, uh, taking the scripture to them and say, hey, listen, based on these, this text, it seems like it's a supernatural birth. And they were like, okay, we're going to teach on that. We're going to teach on that. And it never happened. Mm -hmm. So that was like red flag number one. Red flag number two is the other one I always talk about where uh, we were reading about the Pharisees and Sadducees in scripture. Immediately, my heart was pricked. And I, was, and I told myself, I said, man, we behave just like them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And then I said, and then I talked to my mother and I said, hey, mom, you know, when we were reading this text about the Pharisees and Sadducees, and she was like, shut up, don't say anything. Because she said she felt the exact same thing, but we didn't want to speak up because when you speak up in a cult, you become public enemy number one and everybody's looking at you. You start to get kind of isolated and pushed away or you are the rebellious one. So you're kind of breaking up the the idea of the whole group think mentality. If anybody kind of diverts away, they're the enemy. They're being led astray. They're becoming rebellious. And so we didn't want to be like that. So we didn't say anything. Was it common for people to kind of be like, mm, I'm out, this ain't really working for me, or was it? <laughs> it you know what? I wish it was, but it's not common. Um, because you got to think about it, e even us as Christians, we have this community of believers. We have friends. We have you know the different apologists that we interact with. Imagine if one, if all everybody just cut you off. Now, as, as strong as you may be in Christ, that's mm -hmm. going to hurt. Yeah. Now, if you're part of a cult like this group where your whole community and your whole world is wrapped around them. And the moment that you leave, you're cut off like I am. Uh, now you no longer have a relationship with your mom, with your family, with your children sometimes, with your spouse. And so that is kind it acts as a sort of deterrent to actually leave the cult because you're more tied to your family. But what you also realize, and what I didn't realize at the time was my entire faith was based on not the Bible, but my desire to be part of God's family, my desire to be part of a community. And once that was taken away, my whole faith was uh, shook up. So, yeah. Oh, I can't even imagine what that's like because I like having friends. But I mean, <laughs> you know, the Bible does talk about like, hey, sometimes you, you just got to you got to walk away. You know, sometimes yeah. you might have to lose everything for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Would you say that you pretty much lost everything when you uh, yeah. Uh, my mom uh, was my everything. Uh, I had a really close relationship with my mother, loved her and still love her very much. And I understand why she's still in it. She's afraid uh, yeah. and afraid to leave, afraid to lose her daughters and, and her husband and, and, and you know, the community. 
Um, so it's it's hard. It's hard um, just to have uh, people you love. And even and the thing is, I even had friends in the group that were I was growing closer and closer to. So once I left, no more friends, no more mom, no more sisters. Um, when I left, uh, my sisters were pretty much in diapers. Now they are like in college. So oh my goodness, I, I missed the whole thing. Um, so, you know, when you leave a cult, this is why I, I tell people all the time, when you're talking to people who are in cults, you have to think about what's going on behind the scenes. You have to think about not just winning the argument, winning the soul and having them have a strong relationship with Christ because they're going to need it if they leave. Because, you know, it's like, what do you do after, let's just say, you know, I talk to a Hebrew Israelite, they repent, they believe, and they decide, okay, I'm going to just separate from my family. What do you do next as a Christian? Mm -hmm. Do you just say, well, I did my job. Now you just got to be on your own because now they're going to be by themselves and yeah. all alone and everything they've ever known about God. Uh, and that's how it happened with me. Everything I thought I knew about God was a lie. Now, not everything they taught was a lie, right? Don't commit adultery. Don't cheat on your spouse. Those are good things that were taught. And, and they were very good things that were taught in that group. But overall, it was based on a lie, right? That you don't know who Christ is. You don't know the Trinity, the, the you know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's, there's no understanding of that. It is only based on how well you keep the law. And um, yeah, so one thing I want to say too, um, and, and it was heartbreaking, I had an opportunity to talk to my mom. She was in the hospital a while back, and I just went. And I had a conversation with my mom, and I asked her, I said, Mom, you know, how do you know you're going to be saved in the end when Christ comes? Like, what is, do you have any assurance? And she said, no, she says, hopefully I did enough good works to be saved. So her whole, she's, she doesn't even have an assurity that she will be saved. She's relying on, hopefully I did enough good things in order to be saved. Oh, yeah. That's so sad. And that's just so common within cults, right? Like they yeah. make you do all this stuff, but then you don't have you don't even know if when you get to the end what's going to happen to you like will you be accepted and that's just so unfortunate to live your whole life under this bondage and still have no clue what happens mm -hmm. at the end um i did want to shout out i got got a ten dollar super chat super sticker from marlando thank you mr clemens whoop, whoop. <laughs> thank you dunamis dunamis says how did the group you were a part view a part of you the 400 over 430 did it mm -hmm. happen during Moses or now for those in America? Do you even understand what question he's asking? I think so. I think he's talking about, um, let me the, make the sure. prophecy, is that? The prophecy? Clarify, clarify your question because yeah. I want to make sure I answer it correctly. I don't want to answer something completely different than you're wanting. Yeah, let us know. Let us know, Dunamis. And I wanted to know, like, since you have y your mom still in it and your sister still in it, how mm -hmm. do they treat women? Like, do women have really a role within the VHI community? Um, well, I've never experienced or witnessed any mistreatment of women. You know, the women have to have their head covered in the, in the, in the, anytime they're reading or praying, uh, the word of God, or, you know, um, that was pretty much it. The women, uh, at the time I was there, the women sat in the back of the church with their heads covered. They had to wear dresses. There, there was no wearing pants at all. Um, and so whether you're a little girl, a baby, an infant, you know, you're wearing, you're wearing a skirt, um, and you have to have your head covered. Um, but I believe, uh, to some extent, maybe it's been relaxed in that maybe, uh, unless they're, cause it used to be where you, they had their head covered all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but now I think it relaxed to the point where now it's only if they're praying or in the presence of like elders and deacons and stuff like that. But, you know, again, the theology changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why it changes, and I just want to make this evident to the audience, is because it's not founded on anything solid. Mm -hmm. My belief in the deity of Christ is not going to change because it's founded upon Jesus. It's founded upon scripture. I'm not going to, you know, 10 years from now say, well, you know what? I don't think Jesus is God. That's not going to happen. And if I do, you guys just cut me off. I'm a heretic. Uh, <laughs> or, or at least correct me in love and then hopefully yeah. you know, res rescue me. And then if not, if I don't listen, just throw me away. But um, I'm sure BK or Nate would be like, come over here, man. <laughs> Let's have a conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So can you tell me, like, what's the hardest thing about being a Hebrew Israelite? And what I mean by that is like when it comes to keeping the laws, like how involved is this? Because I can only imagine that it's very, very difficult. Um, it is. Uh, but you know what? The Hebrew Israelites don't keep the law. They don't. <laughs> I mean, if you just look at the laws and, and what they claim to keep, mm 
mm-hmm. they think by not eating pork, wearing fringes, and cursing out the white man and saying that you are an Israelite, they think that's it, that that, that you have it set in stone. Um, but when it came to keeping the law, some of the things we did at War Fringes, according to a scripture that's talking about Levitical priesthood, um, <laughs> uh, uh, not eating the pork, Leviticus chapter 11, but they that's not the only portion of that chapter. They they quote Leviticus 11.7, uh, which is the pork scripture. Um, but if you go through it, uh, you realize that if they're going to actually try to keep the law, they would not go to a restaurant to eat. They would not shop at a supermarket mm-hmm. because things are coming into contact with clean and unclean things all the time. So things like that. Um, so, you know, uh, so I wore fringes, tried to keep the dietary law. We kept the high holy days. When I say kept the high holy days, we recognized them as holidays in the same way that Christians may celebrate Christmas and things like that. Um, again, if you're going to keep the high holy days, guess what you have to do? You have to do the sacrifices. You have to do all the offerings. You have to do everything that is required of that high holy day. It's just simply celebrating it is not keeping the day uh, the way uh, Yahweh intended or God intended. So yeah, so we tried to do the best of our ability to keep as much of the laws as possible uh, that we were able to keep and w- we were satisfied with that. Yeah. Well, I did, I wanted to bring up Kim's question because we kind of touched on the fringes. Um, mm. Do you remember like why, why do they wear fringes? Do you know? Uh, there's a scripture that talks about the ribbon of blue representing the commandments and, of course, the fringes. Uh, so they, the the fringes at the time were, at least when we were taught, uh, are supposed to remind us of the many commandments of the Lord. And we were meant to wear them based on scripture. So I forgot the, 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 the chapter and verse exactly. I would have to go look it up again. It's been so long since I've been taught that. Um, but it was all about uh, the ribbon of blue remem- uh, represented the holiness and 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 the the purity of God's word and the fringes were all the commandments that we had to keep and we were commanded based on scripture to wear fringes. Hmm. Yeah. All right, warrior woman, my girl, what's up, sis? She says, hey, <laughs> y'all make sure if you're going to ask a question, put question in the front of it. I will ask you guys to kind of hold off till the end so that uh, so, so that I can get my questions answered first. But if I see something <laughs> that just pops out at me, I, I might I might still do it. So but yeah, if I don't get to it, just hold it off to the end. Um, okay, man, we're making, we're, we're making some good progress here. I think. Okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Hope so. (laughs) I think so. Kent, is there anything off the top of your head that you can say, like, I know that we're supposed to be keeping this law, but we don't, I know you gave us a few, but like, is there anything else? Like there is no way that any of these Hebrew Israelites are keeping this law. Um, you know, it's interesting. When I was a Hebrew Israelite, I didn't understand my beliefs as well as I do now. And that's mm-hmm. crazy, right? You would think, well, as a Christian, you should understand Christian beliefs and not false beliefs better. But as I study the scriptures more and more, I realize just how off off kilter or off center they are when it comes to the text. And I realized and I learned my beliefs actually a lot better because I had to seek to answer these questions. Um, when I left and I was in that, I would say that four to six year period where I was unlearning the lies in a sense, I had to revisit all of my old beliefs, whether it was, you know, who are going to, who are the Gentiles? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, do I have to keep these laws or not in order to be saved? And I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to be in God's, uh, good standing. I I wanted to be, that was one thing that I didn't lose is that I always wanted to be loyal to God. Mm -hmm. And this was my only understanding of the Bible. I didn't crack open a Bible and start studying until it was with the Hebrew Israelites. So my whole foundation began with them. And um, so as time passed, I started studying the scriptures more. I started unlearning the lies. I started uh, revisiting a lot of uh, the old beliefs. And the more I I read it, the more I realized how wrong I was Mm -hmm. um, and how much we were, again, off center of what the actual uh, text was actually teaching. And that's what taught me more about my old beliefs and why they were wrong. Um, And I can only attribute that to to God's grace Mm -hmm. and his love and his patience with me after leaving that group. That is so real. And I think Christians, you know, we should hold ourselves to that same standard. We we should not just let our pastor being the only one who can tell Mm -hmm. like too many people depend on their pastor to have the knowledge. Now we need pastors. We need community. It's good to be discipled because it is easy to get the the scriptures wrong. That's why we have cults that keep popping up. You know, these these role groups like, oh, I don't like what you're saying, so I'm going to start something. And then they mess up all these scriptures and then it just destroys lives. Mm -hmm. But that being said, if you don't know the scriptures for yourself, 
it's going to be a lot harder to discern what's actually right versus what's wrong. So I am all about Christians, like really reading your Bibles, take a year and mm -hmm. read it. Don't become a teacher in that first year because you're not <laughs> going to know what you're talking about. You know, read it about 10 times and then, then maybe start a YouTube channel. You know what I'm saying? Like as someone who I probably read the Bible, maybe at least five times straight through, mm -hmm. um, between high school and college. And it wasn't until after I graduated college and started like learning more about theology that I realized, man, I, I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that I gotta, I gotta fix that. I'm thinking this and it's written like the scripture is not saying that at all. So I just said all that to say, be careful about trying to be a teacher right off the cuff. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I, I would say this, you know, um, being a teacher is a heavy, heavy responsibility. Every word that comes out of your mouth can either do one or two things. Either it would draw people toward God or it can push them away from God. Mm -hmm. Every word that comes out of your mouth has heavy weight when you're teaching the scriptures. Yeah. You know, every time, you know, and I, I prayerfully uh, take my time and ask the Lord to guide my words, to take out my understanding. Let me speak what he says and, and give me wisdom to, to explain. I'm scared to death sometimes to teach, mm -hmm. not because I don't want to. I love teaching because I understand the, uh, the kind of transformation it can provide to a person. Uh, it, it, that's what happened with me. I studied the scriptures and all of a sudden I started believing in God and the things that I used to do that I wasn't convicted about before. Now I'm convicted. And that's another thing. Uh, when I was in the Hebrew Israelites, I wasn't convicted about certain things. Really? Like it didn't like, yeah. So I'll give you an example. This is a very clear, easy example. I love film. I love movies. I love talking about movies. And when I was a Hebrew Israelite, certain movies were have certain scenes and those scenes now I have to either cover my eyes, fast forward, or just stop the movie. Mm -hmm. When I was a Hebrew Israelite, that didn't bother me. Like that wasn't an issue. I would just, and I, I wholeheartedly believe it's because the Holy Spirit wasn't with me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't convicting me. I wasn't in Christ. So now when I became a Christian, all of a sudden these things start really bothering me. And I'm like, ah, and I can't do it anymore. And I'm pushing it away. Certain music I used to listen to, I can't listen to anymore. And, you know, all these different little changes started to happen. And that's when I started to realize, I'm like, wow, the Holy Spirit is actually convicting me for real versus before how it used to be, where it was all about, as long as I was keeping these laws, I'm good, mm -hmm. right? It's just, but that's not a relationship with Christ, which is extremely important to have. We call that sanctification. Imagine that. <laughs> sanctification. Uh, again, when we're talking about even some of our churches and professing Christians, internet Christians, it's like people really believe that you can become, you can be saved and your life never change. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong with that. That should be a major red flag. We are not saved by works. We are saved by grace through faith. But your works are evidence of whether or not you are really saved. Can mm -hmm. I get an amen? Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of film. Okay. I have, you know, can you tell us about your YouTube channel that's focused on film? Because you have two channels now, right? Yes, I do. Um, so the other channel is called Real Reviews, uh, technically with SOC. Uh, what we do there is we examine film through a Christian lens. We talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in film, uh, whether you know it's unbiblical or it's biblical, or anytime a movie mentions something biblical, we try to talk about it. Uh, so basically, we use uh, different movies uh, to talk about, just to have different kinds of conversations. And remember, every time you're watching a film or a movie, the director, the writers, and the producers all are trying to tell you a story, tell you a narrative, or kind of lean you in a certain direction of belief. So when you're watching a movie, you're not just blindly just saying, that, oh, this is just entertainment. It's not. There's messages. There's things in there that directors and writers are trying to get you to believe, trying to get you to accept. And sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes movies have really good themes. Uh, one of my favorite films of all time, The Last Samurai. Uh, very, very good film. That was the first uh, real review we did. Uh, was that of my favorite movie? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good things in there. There are some things in there that are idolatrous. So we have to talk about, you know, uh, the different uh, gods and things like that. And so it just opens an opportunity to to kind of use the culture, very similar to what um, the Apostle Paul did in Acts 17 when he refers to their temples and their gods, and he quotes Epimenides, and it's talking about Zeus, and he takes that and he twists it and uses it for God, mm -hmm. and all that um, is what Real Reviews is about, just taking what the culture is talking about, what the culture is watching, opening their eyes and helping them to kind of examine, you know, film and media, but also life 
through Christ. I love the Real Reviews channel. I know we're getting a little bit off, but I just, I love it. I think it's such a good idea. I remember when you first launched it, I was like, I should have thought of that. That is genius. But it's so cool to like- Do it with music, Titus. I think <laughs> do it with music. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I think I'm going to leave that to y'all. You're professional <laughs> at this point. Oh, whatever. <laughs> but you have an amazing panel. I was on the panel once. Yes, you were. A long time ago, back in the day. But you, remember, you remember what we talked about? Which, oh, oh, y'all. It was Twilight. It was Twilight yeah. versus. You don't remember? The Lost Boys. The Lost Boys. And that yeah. movie scared me. And I said, what do y'all have me watching? <laughs> My goodness, but that was fun. So y'all make sure you subscribe to both of Jordan's channels, mm -hmm. Servant of Christ Ministries and Real Reviews. So Warrior Woman and Nate have been holding it down in the chat for oh, us. They're awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know what's interesting, Jordan? I don't know if I've told you this before or not, but I remember seeing your video on YouTube, the one that went like viral, viral. Which I don't know. One? You might have you might have he's like, oh. Oh, which one? Which one? Sis? No, no, believe me, because I'm I'm trying to <laughs> There's only two, so I'll show <laughs> <laughs> your testimony when oh, you were talking yeah. about, you know, become or becoming a Christian after being a Hebrew Israelite for so long. I had a little so hair in that video. My heart, <laughs> 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 man, that was a minute ago. I was like, man, this is so awesome. I never knew that me and you would end up like, you know, being in the same circles and stuff. Uh, yeah, so I praise God for that. But I loved hearing the story of how you and your wife, oh, met. of course, and so. If you could do me a solid and kind of take us back down memory lane. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so basically how I met my wife. How, okay. how I met you. <laughs> if you know, I you know. You. Yeah, you see that. You see that. No, just, um, okay. So uh, I was working for a popular retail company at the time. And my wife is an interior designer. And she was contracted by them to help with some projects. Uh, I met her there. Um, and we started having conversations. Uh, we would uh, have breakfast every morning at Chick-fil-A. Um, and we would just talk and get to know one another and ask questions. Um, and I found that I was falling more and more in love with this woman. I just now I say falling. I'm not talking about it was like, oh, it was it's like stars. Right. But I one of the things because um, remember, when I was a Hebrew Israelite and this is where the story kind of takes a hard turn where everything kind of starts breaking, but also I find uh, this beautiful wife. Um, so me and Michelle are talking. I find her to be absolutely different from what the Hebrew Israelites were teaching me, right? All oh, the women in the world, they're wicked. They got to come to the school to learn and so forth and so on. They're not righteous until then and blah, blah, blah. And yet I'm having this conversation with this beautiful woman. And I'm like, she is so like, like gentle. She is very loving and kind. And I'm like, she's completely different from everything that they were teaching. And so I just loved her. And so we, we got to know each other. We had lots of conversations. Uh, we were friends. Now, of course, uh, this happens in the span of, check this out. August 5th was our first date. We went to Six Flags, right? And uh, we were joking and all that stuff. That was our first date. And then October 29th, we're married. Um, so it was quick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, I knew her because she worked in the facility, but then I didn't really know her. But then we got to know each other. And then when we started talking and then we had our first date and then I was like, I'm not going to waste any time. But this was also a very scary moment because I knew that if I took her to be my wife, I was going to lose my family and everybody I've ever known. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, by God's grace, I'm so happy that I made the decision to marry my wife because without her, I would not have been able to sustain the damage that I went through as far as the trauma. The Lord knew exactly who to put in my life to comfort me in those hard moments, uh, to be with me the entire time. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of the story in a nutshell. So you were a Hebrew Israelite when you met her and she was a Christian. She, she was a Christian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh my goodness. I love a good love story. Yeah. Y'all are, <laughs> are so cute. Next on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a movie one day for sure. And that'll be kind of cool. Yeah. It'll be on real reviews in about <laughs> 15 years. So how did she feel about you being a part of that? Like, how did that affect you guys' relationship? Oh, wow. That's a uh, you, you hitting the, the good question, Ms. Titus. <laughs> okay. Um, so my wife, when she Okay, so it's it's interesting. I was a Hebrew Israelite. She came from the Word of Faith movement. So that clashed, right? Because I was super legalistic. She was super, oh, it's okay. You know, I'm just, just you know, 
speak things into existence, mm -hmm. you know, all these kinds of things. Uh, and what ended up happening, uh, and this is why I love her so much. She was willing to listen to what I had to say without talking down to me and disrespecting me, mm -hmm. right? Which speaks volumes, not of me, but of her character. Yeah. Uh, because she could have easily said, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. But she didn't. Uh, I remember I was trying to keep the Sabbath day in our home. She didn't fight me on it. She was like, okay, we'll keep the Sabbath. And she didn't fight me. She she gave me the time I needed to try to work this through and respected me and loved me and treated me like a good husband. I was a good husband at the time, but at the but at the same time, you got to imagine from her perspective, here's this super legalistic person and she doesn't believe any of the things that I used to believe. But what's interesting uh, is uh, during the first, I would say month or so, it was hard. All right. Because you got, we're, we just got married. You have these two different backgrounds clashing on a lot of instances. And, you know, we got into heated uh, debates. <laughs> and um, what ended up happening was at one time we just sat down. We said, you know what? We made a vow before God and, and, and we made a vow before Christ. Let's make this work. And from that moment on, we did not have any issues. Right. The moment that we founded it on Christ, our relationship and our marriage was founded on Jesus. I'm not saying we never had a disagreement. We never had an argument. I'm not talking about that. That's La La Land uh, movie stuff. But our relationship has never suffered or in that way where, OK, we feel like we got a divorce or anything like that. We kept on growing closer and closer to one another. Um, and this is why I love my wife so much. It's just, the, the you know, it, it I think what the reason why I love Michelle so much, that's my wife's name. Mm -hmm. The reason why I love Michelle so much is because I know that she was a gift from the Lord to me. Um, in scripture, it talks about, it's in Proverbs, uh, I don't know if it's 2810 or I forget the, the, the chapter and verse. But anyway, it says in the scripture that an inheritance can come from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. And when I looked up the term prudent, I was like, this is exactly how Michelle is. And so I took that as the Lord literally blessed me with a wife to be by my side and to kind of walk this harsh life with. So that's why I just I love her. I love her so much. That's so beautiful. I hope all the single guys are out there taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Found your relationship on Christ. That's the, that's the key. That's your new channel. OK, relationships with SOC. Oh, Can my I, 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 I can't handle another channel. I can't stop you, 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 Nate and, and Wawo and um, uh, Roxby always try to give me more stuff to do. I can't handle it. It's I mean, so you're much. just so good at it. I mean, no. I'm just saying. Uh, well, oh, no. Listen, I, I never told you this. You. Congratulations. 28,000 subscribers, sis. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the <laughs> that is so cool, sis. When I saw that, I was like, oh, my good. And, and, and it's hard to do in Christian circles. To have a Christian YouTube channel explode the way you have is absolutely amazing. You do a great job with your shorts. And so keep pushing forward. Keep going. I mean, you're doing an excellent, excellent job. And I pray that the Lord continues to bless you and explode your channel many times over. Thank you, bro. And if y'all want Jordan's prayer to be answered, hit that like button, okay? Hit the <laughs> like button. There you go. Can I get a like? Can I get a like? People keep asking me, how can you support? Some people have been given super chats and super stickers so you can give through YouTube, but that's your thing. I also got a cash app. Holla at the girls cash app. <laughs> so if this is blessing you, if this is adding value, go ahead and hit the cash app. But um, yeah, I thank you so much. Reggie. Oh, whoa, Reggie. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look at the love. Reggie. Thank you, bro. Reggie says, I'm so glad I made it tonight. This blessed me. And yes, I'm taking notes. Stay encouraged. <laughs> you stay encouraged too, Reggie. Thank Amen. you so much. Amen. Um, I, okay. I, I wanted to find out. So I feel like we kind of skipped from Hebrew Israelite to marriage, all that yep. stuff in between. It, How did they the take it? How did they take it when you married okay. Michelle? All right. The hard, the hard part, the hard mm -hmm. part. Okay. Here we go. So, um, I kissed Michelle before we got married. Now I don't say that's what you should do. Christians should not kiss before they get married. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I did. All right. That's just my part of the journey. So I kissed her and I felt convicted and I felt like I was about to get kicked out this church. I was about to lose everything. And I remember going upstairs to my room and trying not to say anything, but my conscience would just kept bothering me. And I was so afraid and scared. And I remember I was in bed tossing and turning and I was like, I don't know, Lord, please. I don't know what's going on. 
And I remember I walked downstairs. My stepdad was downstairs. I think he was like making some food or something. And I said, hey, dad, um, I just want to let you know that I kissed this woman. And he hung his head low. He says, I can't believe you did that. He said, we're going to have to talk to the elders about this. Um, I'm like, great. So we uh, go, maybe I think it was the next day or so, we went and talked to the elders. I went into a room, into the back of the house. And not only were the elders of my church there, they also had a conference call with all the elders um, from all the different schools and camps, one from Boston, one from wh wherever. And they were all there. And one guy, I don't think I even knew who he was, was just calling me a whoremonger, was calling me all these things. And I'm like, but I, and I was so scared to say anything that I just shut up and I just let them berate me. Um, now, don't get me wrong. This is not, some of them probably did it out of love, right? Because in their worldview, in their mind, they think that I'm losing God. So they're trying to be harsh with me and trying to shake me back into reality. So I'm not going to say all of them had a bad intent, but I can definitely tell the ones that were not really trying to help me, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, some time passes. They say, okay, we're going to try to make a decision. They decide, well, we're not going to kick you out. You're going to stay, but you're on probation. But now you have to cut off all ties with Michelle in order to stay in the group. So I'm like, yes. You would think after I told that beautiful love story that I'd be like, oh, no. But think <laughs> about it. I just knew that, okay, great. I'm not going to lose my family. I'm not going to lose my friends. I'm not going to lose my relationship with God. So all of those things, I'm like, fine. So I sit down. Uh, I write a letter the day, the night before uh, that I was that I had planned on uh, handing to my wife the next day. So I wrote this letter. I don't want to be together no more. It's not going to work, blah, 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 blah. So I go, and the next day uh, she's sitting at her desk. I kind of go over there, give it to her, and try to walk away. But she opens it so quick and starts reading it. She's like, oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. So I'm like, great. She says, I don't accept this. And I'm like, <laughs> you don't accept this. And if anybody knows my wife, she does not need the attention of anybody. All right. She's very strong, but she's very kind and gentle. But so it's kind of out of character. You know, the more me and her have grown together, uh, it's out of her character, which I just believe it was the Lord. So she... um so she opens the letter. She looks at it. She goes, uh, I don't accept this. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, this is not how you really feel. And she was right. That's not how I felt. But I didn't want to lose everybody I have ever loved. And I was like, yeah. But so again, she was patient with me. She didn't just cut me off. She gave me my space and time. Um, and then eventually we started talking again. We kissed again. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know what? They're definitely going to kick me out now, so I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. So one, early one morning, I wake up. Uh, I try to l pack up my stuff and leave the house before anybody wakes up. Um, but as I'm walking by, uh, the doors open to my sister's room. So it's uh, my sister, uh, Michelle. Yes, my sister is Michelle. Um, and then Sarah and Leah, my three beautiful sisters. And they're all sleeping. And so I go over and I kiss them each on the forehead. I tell them I love them. I said, you know, I wish, you know, I could stay, but I have to go for now. And then I walk downstairs and my mother's there. I'm like, great. I'm not going to be able to make a clean break for it. So I go downstairs. I tell my mom everything that's happening. She goes, are you sure? I said, yeah, mom. I said, you know, they're going to kick me out now. Mm -hmm. So then I leave uh, and I live with my grandmother for a little bit um, before me, Michelle uh, actually got married. Um, but I came back, got some other stuff, and this is where it kind of, it, it was one of the most heartbreaking moments of my life, uh, was my stepdad. So I go up to my room again to kind of get some stuff, and I go to my stepdad, and I'm, I start crying. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I said, I know the Lord is going to forgive me, he loves me. I said, remember David, remember David. And, he's, and he looks me, square in the face, without hesitation, but you're not David. So immediately my whole world sank. I felt like God, because I wasn't as good as David, I didn't fight wars for God. I didn't fight battles and all this stuff. And so what ended up happening was I took that moment and I replayed it in my head for several years. You're not David. You're not as righteous. God doesn't love you anymore. It's over. It's over. You're just waiting for your death. And, you know, there were moments where I thought I was going to die. And I was just basically waiting for God to kill me um, after leaving that group. And that's a place you don't want to be at. You don't want to be in that, 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 that under that weight. Um, so, yeah.
So. So when did the gospel kind of click? Like, when did you figure out like, oh man, I, no wonder this didn't feel right this whole time. Like, how you did? Know, yeah. I wish I could point to one moment. Um, I wish I could point to one scripture that just kind of like, oh, I got it. But it was a process of time. Um, so after, uh, so me and my wife are married and I'm starting to study the scriptures. Um, after I'm studying the scriptures, I'm starting to see little, little, um, little hope, right? I, I see a little hope here, a little hope there. And I think it was one of the scriptures I kind of pop in my head right now that I remember is that, you know, that the sons are not going to pay for the sins of the father and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that I was going to be judged based on my relationship with God um, and based on whether or not I trusted him. And so I remember sitting on my couch, looking up to the ceiling and I said, Lord, and, and it was the same prayer my mother did, but it was a little different, which is interesting. My mother said, God, show me who you are. And then that was it. But I remember looking up to the ceiling and saying, Lord, please show me who you are according to your word. If what I used to believe about you was true, show me that in scripture and I'll do it. But if what I used to believe about you was false, show me and I will walk that way. And so from that moment on, the next day, I'm not saying everything unraveled, but he started unraveling the things as I read scripture. I was like, wait a minute. The Gentiles are not Israelites. Wait a minute. The Lord does love me. And wait a minute. He can forgive me. And then all of a sudden, after reading the scriptures, the Lord just start putting it together in my head. I'm like, wow, he does care about me. And then from that moment on, I started to completely trust him. And I didn't want to hear from anybody. I didn't want to hear from no teachers, no nothing. I wanted just, it was me and the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And he guided me and helped me. And now I'm a Christian today because of God alone. Would you say that you felt like a relief, like, <laughs> like, I don't know. Break every chain. Sorry, that's so close. <laughs> I'm not well, just just. Hearing. I can't sing, so I I, I didn't think <laughs> I, I didn't think in a musical uh, tone like that. Break every chain. I don't know. I just when I hear about like these cults, whether it's Hebrew Israelite stuff or Jehovah's Witnesses, like just the bondage that these people are in. Did you feel that freedom when you came into like? Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, yeah. It was, it was absolutely amazing. Um, when you read scripture and you actually understand what it's saying and how Christ freed us and, and, and you're always learning every day, you're learning more and more. Um, even, I don't care how many times you've read a passage, you'll read and learn something new. That's how you know the word is living, right? Sharper than any two edged sword, dividing asunder even to the bone and spirit, you know what I mean? The, and, and marrow, but you know, it was over a, a process of time. Um, Again, it wasn't a, a an aha moment. I would say this, and I think Nate has has talked about it. Um, the Book of Galatians mm -hmm. was my was my kind of swan song in a sense. I was because after I read the book, I was like, I'm saved. The Lord loves me, and it I'm done. Like that's so. If I was to point at something, it would be the Book of Galatians, um, which I think is uh, perfectly written for a a group like the Hebrew Israelites and any other works-based salvation group. Um, and a lot of the time I, I really saw myself in the Apostle Paul. Um, I, but I thought about it from a different perspective because uh, the Apostle Paul, we we always praise him for his his knowledge of Scripture, for his wisdom and his understanding, being able to talk about the law. But I saw it from the perspective of, here's a man who went through the same thing I went through. He was... A, 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 the Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a law keeper, throwing Christians in prison, standing up for the law, and the Lord broke him or knocked him off his high horse, literally. <laughs> and um, when he does that, and then Jesus teaches him, and then he learns, and then now he's standing up for Gentiles, and now he's defending them against the, the, the Jews um, who are trying to convert the Gentiles. And I was like, oh, man. I said, the Lord does save even those who are hard hearted like me uh, at the time. And, and the Apostle Paul was one of them. So the book of Galatians, I, I would say, is uh, a must read for Christians everywhere. Yeah, I agree. And it's also a must read for people who are still stuck in the cult of Hebrew Israelism. Right. Yep, absolutely.
because this is one of the main things with that group. It's not just that they believe that they are, you know, the Israelites of the Bible based on Deuteronomy 28 is that eventually you start going down just a rabbit hole of heresy after heresy after heresy, not affirming the Trinity, not affirming the deity of Christ, um, works-based salvation. What else do they get wrong? There's just several things that are just wrong, wrong, and more wrong. I mean, they get Jesus wrong, which is the ultimate failure. If you get Jesus wrong, you don't have a faith. It, I mean, you need to know who Jesus is uh, and what he taught. Mm -hmm. um, and they get that completely wrong. They get the birth of Christ wrong. Uh, they get keeping the law wrong. Everything they teach, they get wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say everything, I'm talking about all the wrong things. You know, if they tell you, don't sleep around and don't be promiscuous. That's a good thing. Those are good things. That's fine. Right. But I'm talking about in general of their doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's wrong completely. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. And so speaking speaking of the book of Galatians, you wrote a book. Did I? How long ago has it been since you wrote this book? Oh, man, I can't even remember. I would have to re rely on Nate's memory. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's been a while. I would say maybe two years. Let's see. Can y'all see that? Uh, when did I publish uh -oh. that? Y'all see it? Is it up on the screen? Yeah, it's on the screen. I can see it. Perfect. Okay, perfect, you guys. Um, this is Jordan's book, Judaizer. What gave you the inspiration to write this? The book of Galatians. <laughs> it's like, I, I just said that, but I'm yeah. asking it again. <laughs> I, I published it in 2020, so it's three, three years. Uh, wow. Um, Okay, so the purpose for that, and, and here's what's interesting. I didn't write it as an expose to, 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 to attack the Hebrew Israelites. It's not that at all. Um, although my story is in there, my testimony, which many of you heard uh, during this conversation with me and Ms. Titus, um, it's in the back of the book. But the entire job that I had, because this book meant so much to me, because it spoke to my situation directly, um, I thought that it would be extremely beneficial for other people to have somebody there to kind of explain some of the things from the perspective of a Judaizer. Mm -hmm. So the entire thing is just a commentary. I'm just telling you what the verses say, referencing scripture and things like that. So I always advise people, hey, listen, I'm, I'm glad if you buy the book, it's, it's, it's great, it's encouraging, but read the book of Galatians first, mm -hmm. then get the book if you need help as far as like, you know, trying to understand little nuances. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to do a verse by verse uh, Bible study so that people could understand that they were saved. I know people come from many of the cults today are works based salvation groups. This book can help them. This book can help people uh, understand that they are free from the law. What does that mean? Uh, what does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be part of the family? What is the re what are the requirements to be part of the family? For the Hebrew Israelites, you have to be Black, Hispanic, or Native American to be in, in order to be part of the family of God. What Jesus says and what Paul says is that you need to have faith mm -hmm. in the completed work of Christ. That's it. That's what you need to be part of the family. Mm -hmm. And so the requirements are completely different. So it's no longer, oh, what nationality are you? Because there was racism even at that time. I mean, the... The, the Jews at that time would revile the Gentiles or talk bad about them and, and just treat them like dogs. But at the same time, there were instances like uh, during um, the Old Testament and even then where you would have people who would come into the into the children of Israel through um, even the Old Covenant. But they never viewed them as equal, as family. Mm -hmm. They were always kind of like a step down. This is why Jesus talks about that middle wall of separation is broken down. It's not just figurative. There was an actual wall that had a statement on it that mm -hmm. said, if the Gentiles were to pass through this, whatever happens to them is on them. In other words, you know, the Gentiles weren't even comfortable coming in because if a Jew attacks them and kills them, then, hey, well, that was on you. You knew better. Right. So there was no real. So when God says the middle wall, where Paul talks about the middle wall of separation being broken, he's talking about that wall as well, a physical wall that was there. Uh, you can find that in archaeology and things like that. They have um, the documentation. Have, do you have a video on that? I would love to see a video. I should I should do a video on that. I talk about it in the book, but I, I should make a video about it. That would be great. Please Thanks do. Thanks for the idea. <laughs> and I will say, I think your series on cults was really, really good. I think that's a great idea because a lot of us don't think about the psychology, like what people go through emotionally coming out of a cult. So... 
I just I just really admire what you're doing with your channel. And I'm so glad that you came on to hang out oh, with us man. tonight. This is, uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, anytime. And before I forget, I saw a couple super chats. Craig, thank you so much. Carl Martin, thank you so much. And you guys, I know a lot of people had questions. We'll do questions for maybe like five or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get to them sooner. But if y'all want to drop some questions in the chat, we'll hang out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, this, this is SLC, everybody. Make sure you subscribe to both of his channels, Servant of Christ Ministries and Real Reviews with SLC. Okay? I would appreciate it. And give me a thumbs up. Okay? And when <laughs> please help, help a girl out. Y'all yeah. want videos to reach the nations for Jesus. I need a like. And I'm gonna need some comments in the comment section after this live chat is over. Please, please. 30,000 subscribers. Come on. It's amazing. And it all happened in like what? I don't know, the last it was quick. Eight months or something. Yeah. I I had no thank you, Lord. Thank you, yep. Lord. Because I appreciate I enjoy doing this and I enjoy like having different people on the channel who can talk about Hebrew Israelism or shout out to Colin who was here last week and we talked about that was an excellent, excellent stream. Yes. Y'all both did good on that. And I Colin it. killed it, man. And the, the parallels between Hebrew Israelism and Seventh day Adventism, I mean. There's definitely some overlap there, right? Fun, fun fact. I almost became a seven-day Adventist. What? When? When did yes. this happen? <laughs> um, it was it was while I was trying to understand the scriptures. And uh, I think a lot of it came from my, uh, I would say it's the, it was trying to hold, I was still trying to hold on to some semblance of what I used to believe. Yeah. And if you know the seven day Adventism, you'll you'll realize that they are, in a sense, a works based salvation group in many instances. So I was like, oh, we at least got to keep these Ten Commandments. Oh, this group is kind of like that. And it's kind of like Christianity It's kind of yeah. mixed up. And so it was attractive. Yeah. And I thank the Lord that I witnessed the baptism at a seven day Adventist church where they said you have to accept the spirit of prophecy. Do you accept the spirit of prophecy? And Colin already talked about that, that that's talking about Ellen White. So I visited the church, they had a baptism, and I watched this happen where we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and do you accept the spirit of prophecy? Now, I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. right? I was like, well, maybe they're just talking about you have to, you know, accept, you know, the Holy Spirit and prophecy in scripture, right? I, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe that's what it is. My wife wasn't having it. She was like, nah, she said, I know it. <laughs> She goes, I, doing this. <laughs> she said, she said, I know what they're talking about. She's like, Jay, that's Ellen White. I said, really? You think so? And I went back. I was like, yo, that is Ellen White. She was just included in baptism amongst the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. So I was like, I knew enough to say, okay, that ain't happening. So I went right back to my little Bible. I started studying <laughs> some more. And I was like, okay, I see where I was going wrong and stuff like that. You mean Ellen White wasn't in your Bible, SOC? Huh? No, not at all. Thank you. Interesting. Goodness. She wasn't yeah. in mine either. Which one of these doesn't belong? Hello. <laughs> I didn't ask this, but we're gonna we're gonna slide this question in right quick. Did y'all read the Apocrypha? Was that like a big deal for your camp? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, the Apocrypha. Oh, what a book. Um, so here's here's something interesting. There's some historical things that are good in there that are actually accurate. But there are some things that are wrong. Uh, one of the, the things I like pointing out is the book of Tobit in uh, the Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. And I should probably do a video on this, too. You're giving me a lot of ideas for videos. Yes. Uh, do a breakdown of the Apocrypha. So, for example, like Miss Titus, too, if if somebody were to come, let's say, to you and say, hey, listen, these evil spirits are bothering me. So I made this potion and concoction to kind of fight them. What would you say? That's, That's witchcraft. witchcraft. Mm -hmm. But Tobit does it. Mm. And, and they're okay with it. Mm -hmm. It didn't say the Lord told him. It's like some angel told him to make some concoction in order to ward off the evil spirits off of some woman that he was going to try to marry, that everybody was dying every time they tried to marry her or to come into the chambers. And so he makes this concoction. He gets the gall of a fish and he turns it to burn and he puts it around the bed. And you're like, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. This is witchcraft. <laughs> we know the Lord didn't tell him to do this. How does the Lord say you pray? And right. you ask the Lord Jesus <laughs> to handle it. Right. You know, we don't try to, you know, listen, we talk about things like movies like Constantine, where he does all this supernatural stuff. That is blasphemy and wicked. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. And we talk about it on our channel. We don't hold back just because we may like the theme of a movie mm -hmm. or the, the the dialogue or the, the way it looks. But we talk about the bad stuff, too. And fighting witchcraft with witchcraft is witchcraft is wicked. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again for the people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the people in the back. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. So that's just one of several reasons why the Apocrypha is not in our canon. Um, you know, there's some historical errors. Some of it is just straight up historical fiction, Yep. you know, and a lot of Hebrew Israelites like Stephen Darby. I don't know if y'all been watching my shorts. Stephen <laughs> Darby seems to have presented the Apocrypha as if it's on the same level as scripture. Ah, uh, yeah. And it's just not okay. It's got errors, you know, messing some stuff up, promoting witchcraft. I mean, it's not all bad, but just because it's not bad doesn't mean that or just because all of it isn't bad doesn't mean that it's scripture. Right. So, so there's that. Yeah, you can have a self-help book teach you some truth. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it doesn't make it the Bible. <laughs> it ain't the scriptures. You know what right. I'm saying? All right, Colin said, when is your debut album coming out, bro? <laughs> what album? I, is he making fun of my voice? I think so. Yeah, probably. All right, whatever, Colin. <laughs> I think so. I think so. All right. Um, right. I'm not. Some of these questions may be from your fellow brethren. Who are a part of the Hebrew Israelite. That's fine. Uh, I'll try so my very best to answer it. Let's see. What scripture do they use to prove white people are Edomites? Um, well, they tried to use the relationship between Jacob and Esau, and uh, he was white and ruddy or anything like that. And they would say, oh, he's hairy. That's me. He's the white man. Um, so, you know, and the thing is, they, they, they rely on dubious things, like kind of like things that aren't really clear. Like, for example, in the book of Solomon, Right. They'll try to use scriptures to try to prove that Solomon, King Solomon was black, mm -hmm. but they accidentally quote verse five and leave out verses one through four. One through four makes it clear that it's a woman that's speaking. Very clear because he she also says, kiss me, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Now, there's only two options. Either you just called King Solomon that right, just algorithm safety. Right. You call them that or. He's not like so. My thing is, you got to be very careful. So they'll use different scriptures and texts. Um, maybe I should put together a list of. I might do. Uh, I've been thinking about it lately. Uh, doing like a quick answer, like on different theology, uh, theological beliefs of Hebrew Israelites, like five little five minute videos, just kind of debunking it using the context of the scripture. Um, so, yeah. So there's not one scripture they use. They they try to use many scriptures. Mm -hmm. Jehu, Jehu Yasharala is upset with us, apparently. I wonder why his first name is allowed to have a J, but not the last name. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So here's the thing. I, I love when they say that. Well, none, many of y'all pulled scriptures. Well, listen, it's an interview. Yeah. Right? It's an interview. Right? I can pull a scripture if you want me to. I can pull 12 scriptures. Mm -hmm. Does that now? Okay, if I pull a scripture, let's let's just test your little theory. If I pull a scripture... Will you become a Christian? Mm. Will you start to believe in the Messiah? Let us know, Jehu. Let right. us know. Right. <laughs> also, shout out to Alton. Alton been talking about the brews on his channel for a while. So subscribe to Alton. And brother BK, what's up? BK in the building. Yo, what's yeah. up? <laughs> Anti-precept packet. Maybe I should do maybe I should do that an anti-precept packet. <laughs> That is debunk their preset packet. That's a good one, BK. That that is a good one. Y'all make sure you subscribe to his channel too, because BK has been such such an amazing resource. He sends me books all the time. I'm like, <laughs> dude. One reason that I've been successfully able to research this fraternity sorority stuff is because of this man. So thank you, BK. Thank you so much. Let me see what other questions we got in here. Okay, this one is from Jay. Who um, we'll we'll try. We'll try. Okay. Why does Revelation twenty two fifteen say outside the gates of heaven are dogs? Then Revelation eleven two says that the outer courts are left to the Gentiles. Does that mean that heathen equals Gentiles can't enter the kingdom? Let me let me debunk his whole position on whether uh, on whether Gentiles are even meant to be saved. Right. So I am going to go to Luke chapter two. This to an end really quickly. To, I'm going to go to, give me one. Okay. So Luke chapter two, verses 29 to 32. And this is uh, coming after uh, the promise was made to Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Messiah come. 
And then in verse 29, he says, now, master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. That's a Greek word, sarks, meaning all human flesh. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's ethnos, talking specifically about people who are not Israelites, and the glory to your people, Israel. Ah, so because many of the Hebrew Israelites believe that Gentiles are just scattered Israelites. If that's the case, why even mention the word Gentiles and then Israel after that? Okay. Wouldn't Israel be an all-encompassing term dealing with scattered and scattered Israelites mm -hmm. and Israelites in Jerusalem? Which means... The very birth of Christ, he says, you have prepared it in the presence of all humanity, all human flesh, a light to, for revelation to the other nations, the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is salvation to all human flesh, to the Gentiles, and to Israel. Oh, that's good. His birth debunks the entire position. So, <laughs> And I have never heard not one Hebrew Israelite even attempt to deal with that text. And I've heard a lot of arguments, but none of them ever deal with that text. Wow. One that point that uh, kind of kind of gave me pause, maybe not pause. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. That stuck out to me was I think it's in Isaiah 19 where it's talking mm. about like how God will, you know, he's going to accept the Egyptians. And I want to say even the Assyrians. I'm like, mm. them don't sound like Israelites. And that's Old Testament. Right. That's Old Testament. Abraham, I love Abraham. Right. Because Abraham is the pinnacle of what Jesus what Jesus was trying to do. Like so he tells him um, uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 22 and, and verse 18, he says, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring. And that's very specific. It's not plural because you have obeyed my command. So the question is. When Abraham was around, where were the children of Israel? <laughs> nowhere mm -hmm. and guess who the other nations were gentiles so the people at that time that he was speaking about was that in you and will be blessed by your offspring and paul deals with this in galatians notice it doesn't say and offsprings as of many but offspring as of one and that's christ so what the scripture is actually saying which is beautiful and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by jesus because you have obeyed by my command mm -hmm. you, you obeyed my command because of faith Come on. Come on. Well, Jehu is still not convinced. We'll be praying for but you. But here's brother. the thing. Like Jehu, he, he quotes a passage out of context, right? He quotes yeah. one verse here, one verse there. I don't teach that way. I teach on in, in a very contextual way so people understand what's going on in the passage, right? Because if I just quote a verse and I front loaded with my theology before I give you the verse in the passage, mm -hmm. then I can make the verses say whatever I want. Yeah. I, could, I can change it. To whatever I want. I can take one scripture here, right? This is how you guys piecemeal here a little and there a little, so forth and so on and stuff like that. Uh, yes, Galatians 3.28. That's a good one. Thank you, yeah. Taylor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what is it? BK pulled up Psalm 68.31. This is ESV. It says, Noble shall come from Egypt. Cush shall hasten to stretch out her hands to God. Right. Amen. Amen. I mean, there's just so many other verses that we could pull out that just totally debunk the Hebrew Israelite doctrine. But oh, I always have a slew of them ready. Just like plenty of them. You know, they try to use Revelation one as as evidence that Jesus was a black man. Um, oh, boy. I love debunking that. Oh. <laughs> it's, just, it's so easy. Like if you just read it like with some common sense, there's no way it's saying that Jesus is a black man or a white man if, because it's not talking about his ethnicity at all. Right. At all. It's talking about his power yeah. that, that totally flattened John. You know, when you got this bright light, his hair was white as wool. Mm -hmm. He didn't say the texture of his hair was <laughs> wool. Right. So mm -hmm. you got to just read. Right. Just There's commas. There's periods. There's you have to pay attention to just basic grammar. Um, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. And I think the KJV even says his head and his hair were white. Like wool. As, <laughs> and then it goes as white as snow. <laughs> so so it's obviously like... it's about pure whiteness or purity and power of who Christ is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, this will be the closing question for the night. It's pretty simple. Is Hebrew Israelite just one sect of the Hebrew Roots Movement, or is it the official name? He or is the official name Hebrew Israelites? Uh, they call they 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 believe themselves to be Hebrew Israelites, descendants from the actual children of Israel. They believe that that's where they come from. Uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement is a little different, but they try to do the same thing. It's another works-based salvation group. So yeah. Um, yeah. So the official name is not Hebrew Israelites. That's just what they believe they are. They have different groups like ISUPK, ISU, IUIC, GOCC, BOCC, and then they have a whole bunch of different groups. But they all believe to some degree that they are the true children of Israel. Mm hmm. So it's a little bit of prejudice, racism going on. I know every person that calls himself a Hebrew Israelite is not like some radical, but right. once you start going down that hole, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. In a lot of trouble. There's one scripture I want to read, sis. Um, Go ahead. Uh, let me see. I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, let me get it. So one scripture, and I read this on Veda's interview as well, um, but it's a scripture that I believe every Hebrew Israelite who claims to be a Hebrew Israelite needs to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3, and I start at verse 12, and I'll read through. It says, since then, we have such a hope, right? We act with great boldness, and that the hope is, is, is Jesus. We are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened, for to this day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted because it is set aside only in Christ. So here we have a group of individuals, the children of Israel, and every time they read the Old Covenant, their heart is hardened. They are trying to keep the laws to be saved. They require others to try to do it. This is what Paul was fighting in Galatians. Uh, and that veil that lies, lies over their face, they're blind to what the covenant is, to what Jesus, to who Jesus is. And this is one that I hold close to my heart because this is exactly what happened to me. The moment I put my faith and trust in the Messiah and his completed work, that veil that was blocking my uh, ability to see who Christ was, was removed. So as long as you stay hard hearted and you just want to throw little verses out there and you and you just want to kind of up your, you, you know, your Hebrew Israelite movement, you're still going to be blind. You're not going to be able to see. It is only when you repent and trust in the Messiah for the for your for your salvation that then the veil is removed. Until then, you're going to be staring at the law, trying to do it, and you can't do it. It is impossible for you to keep the law. Every single one of you have failed. I failed. Titus failed. Yeah. Whoever whoever you want to hold up, this is why relying on Christ and what he did is necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's consistent from the old to the new. The old covenant was pointing to Jesus. Yeah. And then Jesus is revealed. And then what's supposed to happen? The Jews and children of Israel are supposed to let go of the old covenant, hold on to the new, because a lot of Hebrew Israelites don't teach that. You have the old covenant and the new covenant. But what happens is they try to hold on to the old covenant and apply new covenant principles to mm -hmm. their old covenant. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't keep all the laws because Jesus came. No, that's the new covenant. You can't <laughs> borrow from the new covenant right. and apply it to the old. Right. Either you keep the old covenant the way it states because they love quoting Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 uh, and, and, and misquoting Jesus uh, where he says, don't think that I come to abolish the law or the prophets that I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Right. And they say, oh, well, every jot and tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. If that's the case. If you go to the book of Leviticus, you see lots of jots and tittles that involve <laughs> sacrifices mm -hmm. that involve clean and unclean laws that involve how to treat the land, all things that Hebrew Israelites are not doing. So that scripture shakes and breaks their whole foundation, their whole idea mm -hmm. of what it is to be saved. So quoting Jesus actually buries you under a greater burden. Man, it, I couldn't have said it any better myself, but you're the expert on Hebrew Israelite doctrine. So no, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I just I just suffered under the doctrine. But I don't know. You, you got people who are way better at it than I am. No, bro, you you're you're amazing, man. I'm so grateful for you hopping on to share your story. I really hope this helps someone or a lot of people. Um, y'all out there who have family and friends who are getting wrapped up in this, continue to pray for them. Get Jordan's book. 
Judaizer, get his book, subscribe to his channel. And there's tons of channels that, you know, we could connect you guys with to help, especially BK Apologists. So y'all just make sure y'all do that. What's up, 816 Apology Assault? What's up, girl? What's up, girl? But yeah, with that being said, I just want to say thank you to my wonderful guest. Thank you. Thank you to the live chat. And please, like I said again, leave me a comment and like this video. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? All right, y'all. <laughs> Once, um, I think I will try to have Jordan back on in the future. Nate kind of suggested that. And I, I, I think it that. would be good. I saw that. I think it would be good. I don't know. I know he's a busy man. I know he's a busy man. He's, he's got like all these channels and stuff, writing books and all that and telling romance stories. I'm sure he'll Stop. be on Oprah next Stop. week. <laughs> Go ahead and give Oprah that gospel, Jordan. <laughs> hey, listen. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll do a little shout out. If you uh, want to come to my channel, Servant of Christ Ministries, very soon, we're going to do an entire verse by verse study on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. So go subscribe to the channel. It's coming very soon. The patrons already got a breakdown of every single verse. So yeah, can't wait to do it. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, y'all be blessed and thank you for watching.